gentlemen, dear friends, colleagues, it's an absolute pleasure today to welcome you to the sixth annual gathering of our GBS and ICT community, which is organized by Invest Lithuania, our investment promotion agency. And as you all already noticed, this meeting is very different from what we had a year ago. It's still a challenge for us. It will be difficult to observe you, all the viewers, to see whether anyone is asleep or not. But I am sure that this meeting will be even more exciting and interesting. So thank you for being with us today. Today, over the next around hour, we will focus on a number of issues. First of all, on what has been happening in our GBS and ICT industry over the last year and also over the past decade. My colleague Laura will present our brand new reports about the industry. And what I'm the most looking forward to is the distinguished panel that we are going to have today. Our leaders from the GBS industry who will share their thoughts and insights on what it means to be a leader in times of crisis. But first of all, a short retrospective. And I will show you only four slides, so please be with me. If we look at the past decade, it has been a truly remarkable success story for Lithuania. And one of the reasons is that we managed to attract unprecedented flow of FDI to Lithuania. And these numbers that you can see in the slide talk for themselves. Over the past decade, around 300 projects, investment projects, have landed to Lithuania and find a place. And these projects created around almost 26,000 jobs already. In reality, the numbers are much higher for one simple reason, because here we are calculating numbers only from Invest Lithuania, our investment promotion agency, but in reality, numbers are much higher. So over the past decade, our manufacturing community, for instance, managed to attract such large automotive players from Germany, for instance, as Heller and Continental. The FinTech bus, everything related to that, illustrates that Lithuania has become a hub for growth for new industries. And our fourth place in the world ranking illustrates that Lithuania is actually the perfect place for FinTech companies. And such challenger banks as Revolut which came to Lithuania not very long time ago, illustrates that Lithuania is the place to be here. At the, same, at the same time, what we are particularly proud about is our constant focus on investment in environment improvements. And here, as you can see, the famous ease of doing business, which shows that over the past decade, we reached from 26th place in 2010 we are now number 11 globally in terms of ease of doing business. But our ambition does not stop here. And what we are going to do is basically our goal is to reach top 10 globally. And being someone responsible for this index in the government, we actually anticipate quite confidently that we will reach this place in autumn this year. So, to move to the next slide, the last decade what also was also a truly success story for our GBS sector. I remember when we started with Western Union and Danske in 2010, with the first movers. And last year, sector, the sector in Lithuania already reached generated revenue of around 1 billion euros, which shows that it became a really economic, economic important player and sector in Lithuania. 
Today we are nearing the first 100 centers in Lithuania. We have such names as you know, Booking.com, Oracle, Dell, Amersos, Bergen, Macassan, to name just a few. And some actually of the names are behind my back here, you can see in the environment. At the same time, we are very happy to welcome uh, manufacturing and engineering leaders in Lithuania. And also just to distinguish some Yara, Metsa, Otokumpu and, and un other important players. And the growth of the sector also is very re reflected in our strategy, what we are doing in the public sector. For instance, just an illustration. Invest Lithuania has a board of seven members. The majority are independent. And two of the members are representing the GBS and ICT community. One of them will be participating in the panel after, after these presentations. And this is for one simple reason. We are very thankful for them because they help us to see what is happening in the sector at the moment and to react from the side of the government. A little bit about our priorities. The past and success story inspires us to think continuously what we could do together to move even further. And these are a number of priorities we are focusing on at the Ministry of Economy together with Invest Lithuania and other institutions. The most important ones are immigration and connectivity. Our goal is very simple, to have as easy and smooth immigration procedures for all talented people who would like to come to Lithuania as possible. And I very much hope that you will soon hear about our, about our brand new project, the so-called International House, which will be a one-stop shop for all people arriving to Lithuania to deal with all issues related to immigration procedures, municipal services, to even probably opening a bank account and everything in one place. Connectivity. It is especially important in our current environment. And for that reason, we started not very long, long time ago in our reaction to actually GBS community, who, which asked us whether we could organize a direct flight to London City Airport. And we delivered. Now we are focusing on more ambitious goals and the government allocated a substantial amount of money to work on new flight directions, which is especially important in the current environment. The GBS community always and constantly stresses the importance of the labor force. So, our education system helps to meet the needs of the community. At the same time, we are focusing, as I mentioned, on immigration procedures. But requalification is also something which is still an unused potential, I would say. So this year we started with a quite small fund to help people willing to requalify, to upskill or reskill and especially to orient it on tech-related skills from intelligence process, processes, automation, cybersecurity, programming, and other issues. But I'm very happy to inform you that yesterday the government approved 15 times, 15 times larger sum to achieve the same results. And here we will focus not only on unemployed people, but also on employed people who want to change their, basically, careers. Future-focused regulation. You can soon, you can quickly check what the govtechlab.lt is, for instance, where we launch our brand, brand new initiative where we invite startups, business community to work together with the public sector and to solve all the challenges that we are having today. At the same time, 
IPI-focused meetups organized by Invest Lithuania, and also the government yesterday approved funding to support projects, especially in this area. So the GBS community in Lithuania thinking about IPI or IRP development initiatives will be able to use opportunities that we will create together and a little bit of funding to support that. And finally, it would be actually a shame not to mention something about what you are saying about Lithuania. And here are some of the most important factors that you identified in the report for us. You said that Lithuania is well known for well-educated talent. Ambitious people, talented people, motivated. This is not me who are trying to tell something to you. This is what you are saying to us and which actually inspires us all. You identify competitive labor force, especially when you take into account talented people that we have in Lithuania and at the same time business environment. Well-developed IC and telecommunications infrastructure. And the importance of it has been perfectly illustrated over the past two months. When the GBS community, also people in the public sector, myself, had to switch basically in one day to work from home. And infrastructure in Lithuania allowed to do that. Availability of multilingual talent and increasing immigration will help to increase all the opportunities related to multilingualism in Lithuania. But I would like to finish by stressing the importance of social climate and quality of life in Lithuania. This is something what you are stressing and this is something what will be even more important in the future. And what we are particularly proud about in Lithuania is what our society showed over the past decades by adhering to different guidelines, social distancing guidelines, which helped us to reach the results that we are having in Lithuania. And at the same time, hundreds of volunteers which, who organized in Lithuania to help people which were in need. So thank you very much for that. To wrap up, it is important to focus on what we achieved. And despite all the challenges that we are facing today, to think about what we could achieve by working together in the future. And now I would like to pass the floor to my colleague Laura, who will present our brand new report and provide much more information about Lithuania and the sector. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Marius, for such a warm welcome and opening the event. Thank you for the retrospective and all the information about how uh, we, together with the ministry, are improving the investment environment over here. So. First of all, good morning and good afternoon to everybody on the other side of the screens. As the Vice Minister said, my name is Laura. I'm the head of Global Business Services and ICT team over here at Invest Lithuania. And my goal for the next 10 to 15 minutes are in fact to give you kind of the main insights from our brand new GBS report that we are launching today. So I just want to point out that there is so much more data, insights, testimonials and examples in the actual report itself that I can cram into 10 minutes of presentation, but I will try to do my best. So uh, let's go on and, and crack on. So. 2019 was in fact an incredible year for GBS industry in Lithuania. We have grown at around 14% in terms of employment in 2019, which is a very robust pace, very much like in 2017 and 2018. And we are quickly edging toward that mark of 20,000 employees in the industry, which will be a great achievement uh, both for GBS industry in Lithuania and for the country overall. And I'm very confident that we are going to do this this 
this year. And it is already our a little tradition to welcome all the newcomers to the industry that joined our, our cozy uh, GBS family. So uh, 2019 in particular stood out for the wealth of USA companies coming to establish their operations over here. We are super proud and excited to say that we uh, attracted three Fortune 500 companies to start their operations in Vilnius. So that would be Amersource Bergen, McKesson, and Dana Incorporated. We are very excited about that. We also uh, attracted a couple of rising stars from USA tech community. So that would be Sci Global and Rocket Infra, um, Software. And also last year, Moody's Corporation actively started their operations uh, for GBS in Vilnius as well. Apart from uh, this wealth of American companies, we also had a reinforcement from European uh, industrial sector in particular. So Nordzucker landed in Konos for their GBS operations and Vilnius welcome uh, edX and uh, Metso as their new members of GBS community. So overall, a great mix of new companies coming over. Of course, we had a number of very strong uh, expansion projects as well from Western Union, Telia and many others. So Lithuania is strongly uh, going on the very strong growth trajectory. Now, when we talk about growth, we always uh, are interested how Lithuania looks in the context of other Central Eastern European countries in particular. So uh, we always look at the saturation rate as well. By saturation rate, I mean how many people are employed in GBS industry compared to the overall uh, number of inhabitants in the city. So, both Vilnius and Konos uh, grew last year, as you know, and Vilnius in particular grew at the pretty much same level as a lot of other uh, established GBS locations like Budapest and Warsaw. But what is also very interesting to see is that even such very saturated locations as Roslov and Krakow managed to in fact put up, uh, put on even more employment in their GBS sectors as well. And I think it's um, clear sector that there's still so much capacity within Central Eastern Europe and Northern Europe to in fact welcome even more companies for their GBS operations. And as the Vice Minister said, the last couple of uh, months really showed that uh, strong ICT infrastructure and a strong social infrastructure is super important for international companies in their business continuity. So looking uh, to the future, this region in particular seems to be on a very very, very strong path. Now, if we look which countries were the main source of the uh, projects coming to Lithuania, there were no shocking surprises here. So you say stayed in their very much first dominant position. Uh, they employed uh, more than a third of all people in GBS industry. Denmark was at a very strong second place with almost a quarter of total employees. And it was a great year for uh, our Swedish uh, companies. Now they are at 17% mark with a special companies like Telia growing quickly in Lithuania. Now, if we were to look what kind of uh, industries are represented in our sector, uh, again, um, no surprises here. Finance industry is very much uh, on a strong growth trajectory, again, with almost half of employees employed by financial industry companies over here. But what is interesting that in particular, IT sector and industrial sector had strong gains over the last year, with uh, them together adding uh, additional 15 percentage points in overall mix. So we see that even the locations kind of stay the same. There is uh, increasing variety in terms of industries represented uh, in the GBS sector in Lithuania. Now, functional mix is always a very interesting to look at. IT still remain the dominant force over here with close to a third of all employees being software developers, uh, service desk specialists, QA specialists, and, and cloud uh, operations specialists as well. But what was uh, in particular interesting that customer operations had strong gains last year on the back of the growth of such companies as Danskebeck and Booking.com in particular. So we're happy to see that more and more client-facing roles are coming to Lithuania. 
uh, again, uh, compliance, anti-money laundering, and uh, no air client function was growing strongly, again, on the back of a very strong representation from the financial companies over here in Lithuania, as well as the fintech boom. And uh, it seems that the sentiment is that they're still going to grow in the future. And really quickly, engineering, though it represents a relatively small part of the industry, almost doubled its share in the overall mix of employment. So we see that there's so much opportunity in Lithuania still when it comes to electronics engineering, mechanical engineering, design, and so on. And in terms of those other smaller functions, again, very interesting trends with analytics, marketing, legal being on the growth again. And in particular, it was a great year for intelligent process automation as a function. So we know from the data that we have that uh, almost half of the centers either have already established their IP solutions within the center or are uh, developing them at the moment. And we are very happy to see that in most of the cases, this is happening inside the center, so by local Lithuanian talent. Uh, there has been huge uh, gains here. For example, some centers reporting saving up to 400,000 man hours through IP solutions. And companies like Western Union and Cognizant have already received multiple international awards for their IP development. So we see that it's no longer a buzzword. It's a huge trend. It, it's here to stay, especially in Lithuania. Now, cost is always an important factor, so we always closely monitor the wage growth. It, uh, the wage growth level remained at pretty much the same level in 2019 as it did the year before. So wages in IT uh, grew at around 6% level and non-IT functions at around 5.5%. And the expectation is that this trend is going to stay in 2020 as well. I just want to point out that this data is, so to say, pre-COVID. So the sentiment, again, on the ground is that the growth, uh, the wage growth, is going to be even a, a little bit slower than that in the future. But we'll have to wait for the hard data to come in. Now, really quickly, just the last couple of, uh, of slides over here. And we wanted to kind of nail down a couple of uh, interesting metrics that show the overall development of the GBS industry for the last decade. So though even we have a, a number of really strong large centers as Danska Bank with 4,000 people or Western Union with 2,000 people, the average player over here is a strong mid-sized center. So anything from two to 300 people is, is the average at the moment. Now, uh, multifunctional is pretty much the name of the game. So almost all of centers have at least two or more distinct functions. And what is interesting is that it's not only centers that have been in Lithuania for a while and kind of developed, but also newcomers that already come with multifunctional setup in mind from the day one. Now, uh, multilingual capacity is something that Lithuania is generally known for, and it's true in the centers as well, with 60% of the centers performing in functions in four or more foreign languages, and some going as high as 35. And the usual suspects, apart from English, which is kind of a given, would be uh, Danish, Swedish, German, and French in particular. And uh, again, though we have a number of really strong BPO players that do incredible work here in Lithuania, uh, most of the centers are very much captive, both in Konas and, and Vilnius as well. So companies want to retain that knowledge within their, within their group of companies. And last but not least, the attrition rate, it stayed pretty much the same as uh, in 2018 at around 14% mark. And we also saw that companies that are in fact more multifunctional, have more senior roles, a uh, longer career path, have had even uh, reported even lower attrition rates than that. And I mean, we could talk about higher data for, for uh, a while, but we also wanted to look into this other aspect that it's very important and part of very much uh, Lithuania's GBS uh, DNA is the diversity and social responsibility. So we know that half of employees are women in the industry. But what is even more important that this representation goes on to the senior roles as well. So half of all your team leads, uh, heads of department, directors and so on, here are also uh, females. And it also goes up to even the highest level. So we know that 
43% of heads of actual centers are also uh, women, which I think is still uh, and it's, it's an incredible achievement and, and a higher mark to hit for other countries or other industries as well. And apart from that, we know that uh, corporate social responsibility and cooperation is very important for Lithuanian GBS community as well. Uh, three out of four centers are very active in CSR activities in particular. So guys like Moody's, for example, were sponsors of Baltic Pride uh, Gala last year. Swedbank created opportunities for more than uh, 10,000 underprivileged children to get more financial education. Now, when it comes to cooperation with universities, again, uh, GBS centers are very active with them. Uh, we've just uh, finished our investor spotlight program with more than 10 programs being reviewed by many companies and among them GBS centers, making sure that guys that go out of universities are actually equipped with the necessary skills to be active players. So uh, as always an abrupt end, so uh, this is pretty much uh, uh, that I have time for at the moment, so to say. Uh, so as I said in the beginning, there's so much more data, insights and, and knowledge crammed into our 50 page uh, report. We're edging towards Harry Potter here, but we'll try to be uh, go even higher uh, next year. And I just wanted to say that, of course, uh, it's it's been a great year, but uh, most notably, guys, everybody uh, for, for the guys from GBS industry in Lithuania, you have done an incredible work not only helping international companies to uh, serve their customers better, provide better products to, to the markets, but also doing incredible work in making the life over here in Lithuania also better. So uh, thanks to you uh, and uh, I just wanted to say stay tuned. We have the last part of our event just in a second, an incredible uh, panel moderated by our, our friend uh, Dorothy Kalberg from Deloitte uh, with an incredible array of leaders talking about what does it mean to lead a company in the times of crisis. So stay tuned and we'll be back with you in a couple of seconds. Indeed, a very intense um, and short wrap up on the development of GPS in the market. Um, very interesting. My name is Dorte Kalberg. I am uh, very pleased to be with you today. And I'm very pleased about the discussion that we're having. We are, we're gathered under the header of GPS. But in these turbulent times, trying to make sense of it all, we also realize that the commonality of many conversations are pointing towards people, how people thrive, how people organize themselves, and how you lead people. The leadership topic is universal and will be instrumental to the way we recover and thrive from the shock which recently hit us. I am therefore quite pleased with the company that I have with me around the virtual table today, and we will be discussing a few aspects on these topics. But why don't we go around the table and 
have a short introduction from each, uh, each of the panelists so uh, the audience know who we are. Aminta, will you please go first? Sure, thank you, Dorothy, and hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Arminta Salajene. I'm a VP at NASDAQ responsible for the European post-trade business and a site lead for the global technology and business services in Lithuania, and also a proud board member of InvestLT. Thank you very much, Arminta. Over to you, Aista. Hello everyone, I'm Aista Gatavitskiene. I come from Danske Bank, Lithuania, uh, where in parallel to my functional role of running internal services for the group, I also act as a site lead for Global Services Lithuania. Thank you, Aista. Ingrida, please. Hi, my name is Ingrida Shimonita, and some of the first companies who came to Lithuania might remember me from my uh, previous work in the government of Lithuania during the time of financial crisis. Welcome. And last but not least, Melanie. Hello, everybody. I'm Melanie Hughes. I'm the head of human resources for Moody's. Um, and I was uh, fortunate enough to be with the group that uh, chose Lithuania as our uh, global business services center in Europe. Thank you very much. And thanks all of you for being with us today. I was uh, thinking just to get us uh, started and obviously the lockdown is on everybody's mind. So why don't you share with us, each of you, what was your biggest surprise during the lockdown? And it can be personally as well as professionally. Aminta, do you want to kick it off? Um, seeing a young deer uh, crossing a street in a, a very empty downtown of Vilnius during the lockdown and I think more generally you know how the nature was rejoicing absence of human beings during this time. Thank you I can almost picture it. Eister for you. Well, for me professionally, that was surely the unity and mobilization of our leadership team. Uh, since the start, we hardly ever had, you know, uh, misaligned views on any topics and especially the people related ones. And uh, personally, actually, probably it was the fact that my six year old uh, is uh, already has learned some when to read and he is able to read. And I just only actually found out when we're the whole day at home. Oh, that's a nice one. <laughs> Thank you. Ingrida. Well, I would say that personally for me, it was a very nice uh, surprise to find that it's not only my sister who can consult me, but also me who can consult my sister who is a mobile uh, specialist, so she could consult me on virus rather than me consulting her on what's going on in the economy. Mm. But, uh, uh, so I sort of renewed my biology uh, knowledge a lot. But uh, on on more broader scale, I would say that, and it's not typical or it's not particular to Lithuania, but but I think it's a it's a global trend. That societies have showed so much potential to mobilize to sort out issues where governments were sort of lacking. Um, orientation in the beginning there was so much misinformation and 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 nobody knew how to handle this and it was really very important to see that we are so much civic in 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 in, in, in our sort of inner uh, inner us and and we can do so much to take care for for our counterparts or friends or random elder people or whoever medical doctors and and, and other people in need Mm, yeah, unlocking potential here. Mm -hmm. That's a nice angle. Melanie, what's on your side? Um, so uh, like our mentor, I've been um, uh, wonderfully surprised by the amount of wildlife that's around. And uh, um, my biggest learning was that I was able to tame a wild squirrel in my garden. Um, and I got a little picture of Fatty here, who is, uh, deserves her name. It's like, she wakes me every morning with my coffee to feed her peanuts and sunflower seeds. So um, that's my, my learning. I can actually tame wild animals. <laughs> Fantastic. So parallel career there. Very interesting. Thanks all for, for sharing these experiences. Um, I think there is also some experiences that were, that were gathered on a um, more professional global scale in terms of what you actually do when something 
unexpected happens out of the blue and it calls for what we used to call a business continuity plan. Lots of organizations have been working with business continuity plans and, and have departments taking care of them and, and acquired support to do that. Um, but I wonder if they were actually useful and, and whether they were actually kind of, could you put them on the table and, and, and work from them? Um, Aiste, you're, you're nodding. How, how did that work in the bank? Well, firstly, perhaps to start that uh, in the bank, we obviously have uh, and had uh, BCPs in place and in order to keep operationally resilient. So, so those were in place already for a long time uh, before this particular situation kicked in. And, and they were reviewed uh, regularly, uh, sometimes tested, uh, sometimes tested even by real situations. Uh, but not really to the extent that happened this year. So, um, uh, of course, the, the COVID situation was by far the most extensive global exercise for, for us as the organization happening across all the ge geographies um, simultaneously. And uh, a lot of things were uh, thought through in those, so surely they were, uh, they were handy. However, probably um, I think there are two really main learnings for ourselves out of that. Uh, um, and, and one is that, uh, uh, of course, uh, you need to learn fast as you go, because a lot of things were not preset uh, in the plans. Uh, nobody could have expected or actually foreseen the way, uh, the way things can uh, roll and develop. And then the other thing was um, the principle of actually um, executing as many things as possible beforehand, which then allowed us uh, to have much, much more capacity and, and, and you know, free focus um, during the, the events, during the time uh, to focus on the critical, unforeseen changes, unforeseen developments and see how do we act on those or how we limit the impact. So, um, of course, a lot of things went just uh, in, in, in hand with what we uh, pre-planned. Hmm. Did, did you have any element in your plan that said, send everybody home tomorrow? Uh, not not ever to that extent. Uh, we had, of course, uh, the certain, let's say, scenarios, but not in that uh, in that manner. How we could switch uh, our, let's say, uh, locations, uh, facilities, obviously, etc. But really, not to the extent of uh, all organization being remote. So that was the first time ever. And I think uh, um, the fact uh, itself, I think that we um, actually shifted. Uh, over 20,000 people in rather a short time uh, across several countries that simply proved for ourselves it's worth to, to develop and have the whole, as you say, uh, teams or departments working on that. Very good. Melanie, I believe uh, you have a perspective on this one. Yes, um, you know, I, I found out um, a week after COVID hit that I was actually head of pandemics. Um, and so I wasn't actually aware that was within my, my scope of responsibilities because nobody really thinks about these things until they're going to happen. Um, and we, you were talking about, did we envision everybody working from home and whether we'd be able to do that? And I think um, to Aista's point, um, you, know, you can have the best disaster recovery plan in the world, but you're not going to, you're not going to prepare for every eventuality. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we um, actually had some challenges with our technology in August of last year, which really made us, you know, much better at responding to these to these crises. And you know, never waste a good crisis, as they say. Um, we used that to really restructure our technology so that when this happened, we were fortunate that we literally could switch, uh, flip the switch in one day, and everybody worked from home. But it took a crisis for us to get to that stage. Mm -hmm. And you know, my, my, my lesson for this is never waste a good crisis. Um, you know, do what you can to make yourself more robust and learn from these crises that you have, such that when the next one hits, you're more agile and more prepared. True. Aminta, you also represent a global organization um, with, with uh, facilities and sites everywhere and, and an organization that's really intertwined. I mean, did you have a good plan and did anything happen in your dynamics between who does what and, and what's the role of a certain side? Were you able to take over from each other or how did that pan out? 
Yeah, they're very much along the same lines, I, I would say, what uh, I stand and Melanie reflected on and, and shared that, um, uh, of course, this massive undertaking of like switching not only the entire company, I would say, if we look at the financial industry, the entire financial industry switched to work from home in a in almost in its entirety in a matter of just a few uh, days. So that uh, massive undertaking can only um, happen on a solid foundation. So you need, of course, years of meticulous planning, uh, you know, investments um, uh, into technology, operational excellence, uh, uh, regular BCP testing, uh, in order to be ready to, to, uh, to actually, uh, you know, act uh, very quickly and swiftly uh, in, in this situation. And speaking specifically of NASDAQ, you know, we uh, swiftly uh, switched to run markets and manage critical infrastructure around the globe, actually, from homes in New York, in Vilnius, in Stockholm, you know, in, in Bangalore. Um, at the same time, I, I, I absolutely agree um, uh, with uh, the uh, the point that I made that the global scale and impact of this BCP scenario, you know, it was absolutely unparalleled and, and unprecedented and how fast it evolved and also the level of uncertainty that surrounded that. So the only way to go about it was to have a very tight global coordination and take decisions really fast, you know. Uh, so uh, for that, uh, uh, to, to manage this, we had the NASDAQ's executive leadership team and the COVID task force meet daily, uh, where they would take in and process, you know, new information, uh, take decisions, communicate them immediately to the entire organization and switch to execution. So in the, in the early weeks, it was like 24 seven, you know, wheel. And um, uh, now it will be also interesting to see what we will, uh, you know, uh, reflect on uh, as we go into the annual BCP review cycle. So I'm sure we will look at, uh, you know, pandemic and other scenarios with different eyes, like not something that let's park it, it will never happen, but it's good to have it on paper. No, actually anything can happen. True, true. With, with, um, with your notion of, of speed of decision making, I'd have to, like to, to switch to, uh, to you, Ingrida, because I, um, I also um, have a comment of, of yours in mind, where, where you also emphasize the need for speed decision making. And um, you were closer than most other people more than 10 years ago when we were hit by the global financial crisis. Um, and I can't help wondering, I mean, did we learn anything back then that we should have applied now? Um, and are there similarities? And, and can we at all learn from things happening in the past? Because things of this scale don't happen that, that on a regular basis, right? Well, I would say that uh, same like uh, war generals are always preparing for the last war, uh, mm -hmm. same the governments are always preparing for the last crisis. I mean, the crisis that comes is usually somehow not the same. Mm -hmm. And this was not the same because it's not just an economic or financial or whatever. You had a very strong uh, health component here. Mm -hmm. And then that makes things different. But I think there are some things that are sort of universal, mm -hmm. especially when you are a political leader, because the companies have but I would say this is also important for company leaders. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can have two ways of handling this. You can be a very authoritarian and say, look, people, it's a lot of problems. I know what I'm doing. Although in most cases, it's not true, <laughs> not, not in this case. And then you, all you need is just to sit quiet and listen to my commands. And the other, uh, the other way uh, to do it is to say, look, we are all in this for the first time. We have issues. We need to sort that out but I trust, or we, we need to have trust in each other. And anyone who wants to participate, have good ideas or 
or propositions or, or, or wants to handle this or that. I mean, we are all in this together and let's do our best. And this is, I think, is a, well, I would say that this is this truthful uh, way of leadership is extremely important where people tend to be a little bit afraid of what's happening. I mean, it's easy to, uh, sub uh, to sort of listen to a commander in chief, but, uh, but it's much more comforting to have, um, to have a belief in what, uh, what they are saying, to have a, a, a feeling that they actually uh, understand you, feel the empathy that, 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 that is needed in, in such a situation. And this leadership, we can judge on, on examples of New Zealand or Taiwan or, or Germany or some other countries, I think is uh, very productive in such situations. That is, that is indeed a very interesting comment. And I think it's also a very nice bridge to um, the, the next question that I would like to bring up. And that's in terms of the leadership. And, and maybe Melanie, um, how would you go about if we say there is a need for a new type of leadership? There is um, also a need for a new type of personal leader and the way that you have to reach your people in different ways and how we can clearly see differences in what people are naturally good at now. Um, so do you think that this is going to change our paradigm of good leadership? That's a great question. And um, I think leadership does evolve over time, but crises like this um, make it evolve a lot faster. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, I would say uh, you know, it's about not necessarily changing leadership, but emphasizing certain traits of that leadership. So mm. if I had to pick three elements where I would say, you know, we, we really have to focus in these times, it's mm. authentic and transparent communications. Mm emotional intelligence, so leading with your head and your heart, um, and flexibility, challenging paradigms on how we conduct work. Um, and, and what I mean by those things, you know, from more authentic and transparent communications, you know, you've got to really connect with people, town halls, um, engagement meetings. So for example, you know, I, I have a half an hour call, you know, every couple of weeks or so, just for, just for Q and A. Um, and we ask all of our leaders, um, to just sit in front of a Zoom uh, screen and allow any questions to be asked. We've got to ask leaders live. Hmm. And that we would never have done in a normal circumstances because it seemed to be a little risky. Um, but you have to take those risks now as leaders and not be afraid. And I think that, you know, this is, this is new for us. Um, and, um, and we've also created Moody's Moments That Matter, which is, you know, how do we communicate information to you um, about well-being, about uh, information that you need, about um, educating you um, it, in, a, in a way that we didn't do before. Um, I think then EQ, leading with your head and your heart, um, keeping the organization very purpose-driven. Um, and that's focusing on the work that matters. And the work that matters might have changed. So how do we pivot to that? And how do we get people behind a new vision quickly um, and make sure that we're looking after employees' well-being? Um, and that they're feeling part of the community still when they're not in an office. You know, that's tough to do. Um, and then finally, the flexibility and challenging paradigms on how we work. Um, you know, what's our philosophy on redundancies and reductions in force? We've got to be careful and sensitive to those things. You know, what's our thought about returning to the office? Do we have people's personal safety at the top of our list? Um, and thinking about, about work in a very different way, engaging people in a different way, getting the executives to engage with people in different parts of the organization virtually. I mean, those things are, are very different. And I think resetting education to be virtual too, because we're used to kind of having people in front of us, you know, teaching us about leadership. But, you know, I, uh, I, you know how do we make sure that we're getting those leadership lessons to people online? And there's, um, there's an HBR article um, that uh, the, the listeners might be interested in reading on that, which is uh, it's uh, eight ways to manage your team while social distancing. So I'm going to give a quick plug for that article because I think it's a uh, great <laughs> to read. Yeah, that, that was a nice reference. Um, I, um, I think it would be just 
short, interesting to hear from, from also um, the rest of the panel, those, those moments that matter um, in terms of employees and how you show yourself as a leader and how you um, prepare to um, risk the unprepared, just getting out there. Um, Aiste, have you got a, one or two examples of a moment that mattered where you or one of your leaders just stepped out there? Yeah, of course. And and firstly, I would like to echo Melanie uh, in 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 that aspect that uh, perhaps this situation just merely now accelerated and and emphasized the need of of those uh, uh, traits which uh, sort of were already on the horizon and on the topics uh, already for maybe like several years um, in in the leadership theme and uh, we, well in our moments we also. Oh, you know, very much try to embrace this need up for the empathetic relationship, for the understanding uh, what matters for the employee. So putting really them uh, ahead of ourselves as, as leaders, to say so, um, mm -hmm. creating sort of a safe uh, uh, environment, a safe feeling for them uh, in terms of, you know, how they can uh, work further, what will happen, uh, what actually, you know, um, are the next steps that we are going to take. So obviously, Obviously, we used uh, almost all channels that we had for addressing that, uh, but as well, um, the other thing that uh, uh, we would pursue that uh, also previously to the COVID situation, but then again, it just simply strengthened that, is uh, basically taking care of the uh, employees' well-being and mental, mental well-being in order there actually, you know, um, minds would not be filled with anxiety, with concern, but then just uh, get, getting feeling safer and, and confident that they actually can work uh, further. And uh, our happy moments perhaps now are actually realize in, in, in different ways where people give us a lot of appraisal and a lot of uh, good feedback of how they appreciate us being, you know, a, a team, a leadership team and addressing these things instead of putting the uh, pragmatical, very uh, technical, financial, or whatever uh, items first. Very nice. I'd, I'd like to hear just shortly from, uh, from uh, Aminta and then Ingrida the, the same um, question, basically. An example of, of a moment or an example like that. Yeah, and we are getting used to this term of uh, social distancing, but actually uh, I think that we are physically apart and, and physically distant, uh, but I think socially, in many ways, we got actually closer, you know, during, during this time. And uh, these uh, uh, really stressful, you know, uh, times, uh, I think, brought us um, closer together when, you know, everybody is facing same challenges and in a way has also equal up conditions to contribute, you know. Mm -hmm. Then silos fall, distances collapse, and the organization comes together as one team no matter where you are located or which function you perform so i think this is what we've seen that uh, the top leadership you know be it the ceo or the executive leadership of the entire company got very close to every each individual employee and and then the role of the you know the site leaders or the function leaders was also to act as that you know bridge and also be very close to to people and address it on a much more even personal and individual level you know because um i think that this was also a unique situation where the the professional and personal got intertwined so closely that mm -hmm. uh, that we couldn't uh, you know separate ourselves of really very special personal situations and that required a lot of empathy from um immediate managers and and you know uh, higher level leaders to to really un understand that mm. also maybe to add very briefly to melanie's list i think also probably an important trait of leadership in these times is to provide some clarity and certainty and structure in the times of complete uncertainty so even when you are not sure what tomorrow holds but still both be vulnerable and accept that but at the same time give the assurance to your organization that they they will be taken care of in the, in the best you know way so that you, they they have the 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 management team that is uh, you know following the situation closely and will make decisions 
in their best interest. Mm. Thank you very much. Ingrid, can, can you recognize the moment here and also the, the, the topic of eliminating the borders between personal and professional? I'd like to hear your view on that. Yeah, most of uh, what I would like to say was already said, but I would a uh, little bit uh, take where uh, Arminta left that, uh, because um, I think it's very important that you actually, you do not have solutions to everything what, what's happening, but it's really important to uh, sort of acknowledge that you do not know everything mm. and you cannot know everything and what is more important to people uh, who are looking after you listening to what you're saying is the sense that you see the problem you see the issue it's normal not to have an immediate answer and that's why we are all in this together and we we are searching out and we will find the best answer but you need not to sort of play that i know all the answers i know everything you just listen to me everything's gonna be fine i think it's not the leadership that's gonna work in this in this situation i think those were very very nice words from all of you, and I think also, Ingrida, you summarize it very nice. Um, what, what I hear across the, the room here, the virtual room, is very much about being personal. Put yourself in there, out there. It might be that you're on camera, but you can still put yourself in there. So, so in a way, um, the, the borders are blurred, but it also activates something in all of us that we can definitely bring out to the benefit of our teams. We are at the top of the hour and I would wish for one hour more with, with the four of you, but we also want to respect the agenda of today. I want to thank all four of you for contributing immensely to this conversation. I also want to thank um, Laura and the team at Invest with Slovenia for giving us this opportunity for hosting the event. And I want to remind everybody to go get hold of the report. It's online and uh, enjoy reading and maybe also pick up on the HPR report that uh, Melanie hinted at. Sounded interesting. Thanks for now and have a very nice afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.